This is another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. My name is Rebecca Tapp, and in every episode of Decoding Purpose, we speak to humans of both influence and impact to explore how life's turning points help us to decode purpose and to ignite a more meaningful and purpose-driven life. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Decoding Purpose podcast. Now, for those of you who are regular listeners of this show, you may have heard me reference what I call the DNA of purpose, which is a framework to understand purpose decoded. Top level, this is a concept that explores DNA as a metaphor for how we can connect with our individual sense of purpose, as in purpose is like our DNA. But it's also an acronym. Purpose is D, a decision, N, a narrative, and A, an alignment to self. That self may be the individual self, or in the case of today's podcast, a collective self, such as a business or a community. Once the decision to have a purpose is made, then the next most significant part of the process is to find the narrative and to unpack the story. And that is exactly what we will be unlocking in today's episode. So why is this so important in a conversation about purpose? Because purpose is the story that we tell ourselves about who we are. Purpose is the story we share with our team or clients about why an organisation exists. And purpose is the story that we share with the world. Without the story, our purpose is like a sailing boat, but without the sails. Luckily, today's guest has both the boat and the sails. Sails that have brought his story all the way from Arizona into the studios of the Decoding Purpose podcast. His name is Park Howell, and he's a veteran of the advertising industry who has guided hundreds of purpose-driven brands to substantial business growth. Today, he chooses to focus on the one area of advertising that he loved the most and the one area he felt was most relevant to today's digital landscape, and that is the art and evolution of storytelling. As the founder of The Business of Story and the author of Brand Bewitchery, Park now consults, teaches, coaches and speaks internationally, helping leaders and communicators rise above the noise of the attention economy in order to be heard using the power of brand and business storytelling. So without further delay, kick back and get ready to unpack the structure behind how we can ignite a message into a movement turn words into wonder, or take a brand and make it truly bewitching. Welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. Welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. Such a pleasure to have you on the podcast, Park Howell. Rebecca, thank you so much for having me. Oh, you were so welcome. And look, as a as a starting point to today's conversation, I actually want to ask you a question I'm asking all of my guests, and that is given the craziness of the year uh, that has been 2020, how has this year connected you more deeply to your sense of personal purpose? Yeah, it's a terrific question, and I think it's probably what lots and lots of people are feeling is when you've been through as much as we have, where we have a global collective crisis, which is very unusual, and it's shutting down businesses, um, impacting economies, and more importantly, impacting families in a big way. My own brother, Chris, a year and a half younger than I am, almost died from COVID, and and he got through it, and now he's been a long hauler. Thank you. But it comes down to Rebecca, I think, is it, it centers us. It gets us back to what is really important in our lives. And while making a living is very important because we still have to put food on the, the table, mm-hmm. take care of our family and take care of our kids, I think for me what it has come down to is helping, overselling. I mean, doing whatever I can to help people out. And as magnanimous as that sounds, I am still in business to try to make money, and I can't lose sight of that because we all have to keep our businesses going. 
but it has been more powerful in respect that listening longer to people, reaching out to people, helping without charging. I mean, just simply being there as a sounding board or as a connecting uh, or a connection for them. And I think for me anyways, it has gotten me back to my bedrock purpose of just being as helpful as I possibly can out there to help people get what they want out of life. And hopefully collectively, all of us having a better, more positive impact in the world when we do that. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's, it's fair to say that, that what you do is exactly what the world right, needs right now, because, you know, the most powerful story we can tell is the story we tell ourselves, which I heard you reference in a keynote. And I think it's that story that's really going to help us get through these, these more challenging times, right? Oh, absolutely. And for those of us, and I think we all go through this, is don't beat yourself up if you're telling yourself a bummer of a story. <laughs> you know, of, oh my God, I'm not going to get through this. Oh my God, how am I ever going to get business back? Oh my God, what's going to happen next? Because as homo sapiens, we have that negativity bias and our survival instinct is to tell ourselves that negative story. And I think mm. we all go through it every single day. So as if you're feeling like that as a listener out there, give yourself a little slack, find some time to be quiet, to quiet your mind, to find the mindfulness uh, of what could be possible. What does today create in the way of possibilities that you can live into and be more pro productive, proactive, whatever, and less pessimistic for tomorrow? But that's a really hard thing to do. I mm -hmm. mean, when everything seems like it's coming down around your ears, it's hard to find the opportunity in that. So, Park, I'm, I'm going to bounce back before going forward. I know that in 2015, as digitisation and, and the attention economy continued to shift the power away from traditional media into the hands of the masses, you made a decision to shut down your advertising agency in order to focus on empowering business leaders with the one tool you felt would enable them to, to have cut through in an increasingly loud digital landscape. In coming from the world of, of advertising, it's obvious that you've mastered the art of communication, but can you tell me, what is it about the art of storytelling that has given you a sense of purpose? Why does storytelling light a fire in your belly? Boredom. Yeah. I am so <laughs> tired of sitting through boring lectures, watching boring television, having people try to bore me into buying something on TV or whatever, um, having our leaders bore us to death. And the problem with boredom is that it can lull you into this sense of malaise. And I think that can have that kind of impact community-wise, global-wise. I got so tired, Rebecca, of being in the advertising branding world for 35 years of listening to very powerful leaders in corporate situations, in nonprofit situations, in bureaucracies and politics, be boring and yet trying to lead us to more of a promise, a, a bigger thing in life, that they couldn't even see it themselves. So they were boring us with data, facts, charts, and graphs. And the casualty in that are all of those brilliant minds underneath them, the middle manager leaders, right down to the frontline workers and those in the trenches day in and day out that have a mind and a will of their own, that have really amazing things to contribute in this world, regardless of their rank in a bureaucracy or society. And yet they were being shut out by this boring drone of leadership. And that just got to me to the point of I said, no more. Why? You know, I'll ask you this question. In, you know, in America here, we have middle school, of course, high school, college, advanced degrees, and so forth. And I'm not sure quite how they break it out you mm. know, around the world. But when ever are you taught to think in story or to communicate and connect with your fellow student or colleague in a story which requires you to first and foremost understand who they are, what journey they are on, and empathize with where they're going and what stands in their way of success so that you can help them on their journey by connecting your story with theirs. When are you ever taught to do that? Oh. Ever. 
Well, I certainly wasn't at school. I would like to think that there's a bit more of a focus on that these days, but I'm not sure if there is or not. <laughs> I think there is on podcasts. Yeah. And I think people talk about it, but it certainly isn't in education. Not not anywhere. And I, I taught it. Arizona State University, and I'm hired by lots of universities now to come in. And I do executive master's programs mm. and so forth around storytelling and understanding how it works and teaching executives and leaders how to do that. But that's it. I mean, other than that, you don't see a curriculum. And, and in fact, I was on LinkedIn today, and a friend of mine who's a media uh, maven, she had been has been in media forever, primarily in sales, and has since retired, and she posted on LinkedIn, here are the 10 courses that they, they need to start teaching in high school. And it went accounting and nutrition and self-defense was one of them, and it went through it, but not one of them was about communication and or slash storytelling. Given the context of the world, storytelling is such an important way for us to be able to navigate navigate through these times in that it's it's what inspires us to progress as a society. It is, but when you hear the word storytelling in a business climate, if you are not inclined to be thinking of communication in story, you think it's a gimmick. You think it's BS. Mm. You think, oh, you know, those Democrats use story. <laughs> yeah. Those snowflakes, they don't take it seriously. And yet it is the most powerful yet underutilized skill in business that you can attach a real honest to goodness ROI return on investment to when you use it. Yet it is ignored. Mm. So, look, I, I did notice uh, that your expertise in, in both advertising and today in storytelling has has a focus on purpose-driven business, and that is still a focal point for you today with regards to your approach. I have uh, two questions here. What is the role of purpose in storytelling? And, and to take that one step further, do they go hand in hand? Can we even really tell a compelling story without a purpose as the baseline? Well, it's a great question, by the way. Thank so you. So <laughs> what, what, is, what is a story? A story is meant to transport you from the world you currently occupy. And when I say you, that's a ubiquitous you. That's mm-hmm. an audience. Is meant to transport an audience from the world they currently occupy into a whole new world. In some cases, even suspend belief, you know, in, in some of Hollywood cases. In business cases, it's not necessarily the suspending belief as it is to show them a greater outcome, show them a brighter tomorrow. If you don't have a purpose in the telling of that story, then why tell the story? Because your purpose is to move your audience one way, shape, or form. Now, you could tell a, tell a complete lie and fabricate an utter untruth around a story and share that story and still move people, but you have a purpose. You have a purpose of deception. Boy, have we seen that in America in our Mm. administration over the last four (laughs) years. But there's an absolute purpose to that story, and that is to deceive you into believing something that is untrue. But here's the problem, Rebecca. I believe that the thing about stories is they are a vehicle of truth that creates trust. So even if you've got to tell a story about a bummer, something that's going down that nobody wants to hear, but it's truthful and you're honest in that, you have a purpose behind the telling and that is the awakening of people. I mean, just look at, again, and go back to American COVID right now. We have a president that tells untruths about COVID that is magically going to disappear and we have over 70 million Americans that believe that untruth. We now have a new president that is saying, I don't really think it's going to magically disappear and in fact, I am going to put together a task force of scientists and doctors that are in the know about this thing, and they are going to be guiding our story moving forward. Both of those stories have purpose to them. Mm. They they are meant to persuade the American populace to do something. But one of them actually has a truth that will probably benefit humanity much more than than the other one, which is just sticking your head in the ground and ignoring it, and it's magically going to go away. So purpose-driven brands, when you are out there trying to have a positive impact in the world, there is nothing more powerful than a story, a true story well told that will enable you to do that. I, going back to that sentiment I started with, when was the last time you were bored into buying anything? 
Never. So if you've got a big mission that you were trying to push, tell a story that people can emotionally connect with. They can see the future and then deliver on the promises you make in that story. And there's no better purpose-driven brand story than that particular technique right there. Mm. And that's, that's a great segue to my next question because I, I want to go into, a, I guess, another level in understanding the intersection between storytelling and purpose. Um, again, if we can understand storytelling, I guess, as our way of making meaning, then we can also view this idea of having a purpose as the meaning we assign to any given situation or narrative. That said, my personal understanding of of purpose is a little bit deeper than that in that purpose is a feeling. It's it's an energy, an emotion. So in your opinion, how does storytelling move a message from words into wonder? Mm, That's a great, (laughs) words into wonder, I like that. So I would argue that purpose isn't necessarily emotion, as you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. I think that comes along with it. I think when you do have a a really great purpose that is driving you and you're completely dedicated to it, then yes, that emotion that you talk about, that those feelings will well up in you and help give you the drive and the persistence to follow through. But to me, I think purpose is a vision for something that could be better, something that could really help either that customer you're selling to, Mm -hmm. a family member, or a community at large. It's a vision, an aspiration of what could be. And if you really buy into that and start demonstrating that you can deliver on that purpose along your journey, then I think those emotions that you were talking about start welling up inside of you and you you build camaraderie around it. Um, you, You get people behind a focused mission, and that helps you, enables you to achieve your purpose. So with that in mind, in your opinion, what is the link then between, say, storytelling and empathy? Well, um, in order to tell a really powerful story, Mm. it first has to come from knowing your audience. It's not about you. That's what brands so often make a mistake. They think they are the center of the story. They are the hero of the story. They're not. They play the more important role of mentor or guide. So in order for you to land a story, you have to know, understand, and empathize with the audience to whom you are telling the story because you have to tell the story from their perspective, Mm -hmm. not yours, so that you are introducing protagonists and character in the story that they can relate and live vicariously through, that you can demonstrate the conflict, the challenges that they went through, that your audience can completely understand, appreciate, get their arms around, and then you can demonstrate the, their success when they come out of the other end of it so that their audience, your audience, can physically feel that success right down to their bones. But if you don't know that audience, then how do you know what story to tell? If you don't empathize with where they are on their journey, how are you remotely going to connect a story to them that's going to make any sense? You won't. So it. I think all great storytelling begins with the understanding of your audience and empathizing with where they are on their journey Mm. and how you can help them get what they want out of life. So, I mean, the next obvious link from there would be looking at at how to, but before going into that, um, what I'd love to understand is a little bit more around storytelling from an evolutionary perspective. And in watching some of your videos, you spoke about a three-stage story arc. And it was interesting to note that most story structures Tend to, tend to feature these turning points as the gateway to greater meaning, which, is, which turning points are actually the theme of season two of this podcast because what I've discovered is that these turning points seem to act as a catalyst for purpose. So what I'd love to know is can you explain to me why, from an evolutionary perspective, humankind has the need to make meaning. What is it about the human brain that needs to connect the dots in order to give our lives context? Ah, it comes down to one word, survival. Yeah. Pure and simple. So, all right, Rebecca, let's, you and I are going to go back 40,000 years BC. You and I are hanging out in a cave in the Savannah and I'm the lazy cave mate who's hanging out inside and you are now standing at the doorway of that cave and you look pretty disheveled. And I look up at you and I grunt, Rebecca, 
where have you been? And you say, Park, I went down to the river to catch saber tooth salmon for you and I to have dinner tonight. And I go, uh huh. And then you say, but a saber tooth tiger show up. And I go, uh oh, what'd you do? I said, well, I give salmon to tiger. It likes salmon better than Rebecca. Therefore, I am back here at fire with you, safe. And I go, aha. Story dynamics. Uh Uh-huh. Uh-oh. Aha. Setup, problem, resolution. Basic story structure, so easy even a caveman like me can do it. And we do it specifically for survival of the being. So what did we learn in that survival mode? Well, if I'm ever down at a river and I happen to have a saber-toothed salmon with me and a tiger shows up, I give the tiger the salmon so that I can get the hell out of there and save my tail. If I retold that story that night at the campfire with the rest of the clan, I would tell it that same way and they would all be nodding, thinking, oh my God, Rebecca was almost eaten alive, but she got out of it because she gave this salmon to the tiger and safe. My point being, this three-act structure of setup, problem, resolution is basically the hardwired or the architecture in our brain to make meaning out of the madness of being human beings. Mm. More importantly, to understand and to fuel our survival instincts so that we would know what we would do in case it ever happens to us. That is, to me, everything. And again, I'm no evolutionary biologist, but I play one on my podcast and yours. Everything I've read, everything I've looked into keeps pointing back to this fundamental survival instinct and story lays at the heart of that. Mm. And I know in doing in doing my research that you actually offered up a few examples of this three stage story arc. So I'm wondering if you can share some other examples from you know from different shows or, or different people that you've that you've seen just to give the audience a few different touch points of how this three stage story arc works. Yeah, let me boil it down to. And by the way, I did learn this from an evolutionary biologist, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Randy Olson. Yep. Who Harvard PhD biologist. He gives up his tenure, goes to USC film school, graduates, produces three documentaries on climate change, global warming, and has written now, I think, his fifth book on teaching scientists how to use story principles from from Hollywood. So when I first saw this and button, therefore, is seven years ago in his second book. And when I saw it, sifting it through my branding mind, I go, wow. This is a way to get to the core truth of a brand story. So here's the simplest ABT that I can think of. You start with the and statement, which is like the act one. The but statement is act two. It's the problem. And then act three is the therefore, the resolution. This is where the brand comes in to sell. So here's the simplest one I can think of. Most executives communicate and care, but bore. Mm. therefore, tell a story. Set up problem resolution. Now, that statement of agreement, you're trying to keep things positive and say, this is what they hope for out of life. But that state, that problem statement in the middle is, this is what stands behind them, and this is what's happening. Most executives communicate. That's a statement of agreement. Yes, we can all agree with it. And care, and most of them do actually care to connect. But they don't connect because they're boring. They bore. Therefore, tell a story to hook people in. So, you know, that's one example of it. You think about Nike, um, and they didn't use the ABT, but you could set it up for setting up their um, just do it, if the therefore just do it. So Nikes could look something like, um, you know, you wish to get in, you wish to get in shape and you want to do something that is a unique exercise or an exercise that is unique for yourself but you are stuck on a couch eating potato chips and watching TV. Therefore, just do it. (laughs) Just get up and do it. Mm -hmm. That would be another example of it. I mentioned in my book about uh, uh, Lincoln, President Lincoln and Gettysburg Address. If you look at his Gettysburg Address, which was only two minutes long, 271 words, it is a perfect and, but, and therefore. He sets up in the very first line with an and. He goes, but now we are found, you know, locked in war that could destroy this nation. Therefore, here's what we need to do to be moving forward. 
every nursery rhyme. Look around, and most of them, 90% of them are based on this and, but, and therefore the story dynamics of setup problem resolution. Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. Along came a spider who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. Now, you don't hear and, you don't hear but, and you don't hear therefore in there, but they are there. They show you the story dynamics. So, for instance, Little Miss Muffet sat on her tuffet and she was eating her curds and whey. Act one, set up, that's all that's going on. Now the problem comes in. But along came a spider who sat down beside her, therefore frightened Miss Muffet away. Now you can use the and button, therefore, words to help you. And I always co coach people to do that as you start really thinking about this dynamic. But then you can get to the point that you can pluck them out. You don't always have to use them, although I always say, boy, try to use the but. It can be a yet, it can be a however, it can be something, but it is a word that triggers a moment, that turning point, as you pointed out, mm. in, in any sort of story. And look at in the advertising marketing world, the purpose-driven business world, we are all about making change, but we have to trigger turning points if pe in people if we are going to get them to pay attention to us and if we are going to knock them out of status quo and move them forward. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting tool. And, and I'll tell you why, if you just want to come with me on a little journey. But in, in looking at this three-stage three story arc as a metaphor for our life and the story we tell ourselves to come back to where we started earlier in the podcast, understanding how this three-stage story arc in terms of reflecting on our own life enables us to Firstly, identify the turning points in our life so that we can then also see where we've been able to make meaning and find a sense of purpose from those events in our lives. I definitely think there's a, a theme there and a pattern with regards to how we view our own stories in our own world. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's because you and I and everybody listening to this show goes through this. I mean, uh, the oldest story form on record you hear writers talk about this a lot is man falls in a hole, man gets out of a hole. Mm. You, know, you can say woman falls in a hole, woman gets out of the hole. Bottom line is there's conflict. You have a setup, walking along, boom, problem, we've got a hole, now we've got to climb out and get to the other side. Why does that story work on us? Is because you can tell me your Rebecca in a hole story and I get to live vicariously through you I get to try on your trouble from the safety of my own vantage point just to learn what I would do in case it ever happens to me. Mm. Now, you think about any time and have your listeners do the same thing. Okay, all of you listening out there, as long as you're not driving, close your eyes. <clears throat> and I just want you to picture this. When was the most recent time that you wanted something in your life? Something new, something that was going to take a risk. It could be. Maybe you were pitching a new client you really, really wanted to get. Maybe you're changing jobs. Maybe, you know, again, with COVID, your world has been turned upside down, so you wanted something new, and you could see where you wanted to go, so you're excited about it. But what happens? What is the very first thing that happens? The universe punches you in the nose to see how badly you really want mm, it. Very I mean, true. how often? You, we never just say, hey, I want that new car that we can't afford, and then we just miraculously come across the money and go and buy the car. It never happens that way. <laughs> you know, there's always a problem. There's obstacles. There's antagonists that are thrown in our way, and that is just simply life. So when we talk about these frameworks, we're not talking about some mystery, magical framework. We're just talking about what is the reflection of life. These frameworks mirror how you and I and everyone listening to your show experience life day in and day out at different levels. Mm. Sometimes they're epic journeys. Sometimes they're little crazy journeys, mm. but there's, isn't there always a hole that we have to get ourselves out of somehow? Absolutely. And look, I <laughs> highlighted this three-stage story arc because I think for anyone listening to this podcast who are wanting to get clear on what their purpose is, that, that this is a really handy, practical little tool, not only to tell more influential business stories, but also 
to be able to reflect on our own lives and see where the turning points may have surfaced and how we've been able to create uh, a transformation out of those turning points. So it's it's a really powerful little tool. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, absolutely. And while we're here, um, I want to dive into the concept of primal storytelling by going another layer deeper here. You have actually developed what you call the primal storytelling elements. Can you walk our listeners through what these five elements are and why they create such a compelling or influential story? Yeah, absolutely. And I have to, what, you're, where are you coming from in Australia? I am in Sydney. You're in Sydney. I'm in Sydney, yes. So I need to give a shout out to a couple of your countrymen there, Sean Callahan and Mark Shank of Anecdote. And I don't know if you've had them on your show or not, but they are world-renowned business storytellers. And they have a program called Storytelling for Leaders, which I studied and got certified in providing. It's different than what I do because this is more about storytelling with inside organizations Yep. Mine is that, but mine is much more about brand development and getting your people to to tell your brand story on purpose in a much more powerful way. Well, as I was learning these different story categories, connection story, a clarity story, and at some point through all of this, it came down to, they said, there's these five things that really go into every story. There's a time stamp, when did it happen? There's a location stamp, where did it happen? There's a central character a singular person at the heart of the story that your audience can relate to. Number four is action and surprise. Something has to happen and then have this kind of surprise, aha, wow um, outcome that comes from it. And number five is the overall aha moment. How in telling this story does it make your business point for you? So after learning that and seeing how they used it, and I use it with a lot of my clients, I simply boiled it down and I just kind of renamed it because I believe that everything about storytelling is primal. That's what we homo sapiens have used since the beginning of recorded time are are our stories. So those five primal elements are when did it happen? Where did it happen? Who did it happen to? What happened? What was the surprise that came out of it? And how does that underscore your business point? And the reason why that works, I've learned, is because stories are learning tools. They're nothing more than a learning tool. And if you, Rebecca, start telling me about last Thursday, you trigger my limbic system, my, my subconscious mind that automatically perks up and I have no control over it and says, oh, Park, we better pay attention to this because Rebecca's about ready to tell us about something that happened because she's given us a time stamp. Mm. A location stamp does the same thing. Oh, this event actually occurred somewhere. So all you're doing is peaking the interest of the subconscious that says, Okay, survival apparatus, you better pay attention to this little learning event that that uh, Rebecca is going to share with us. Then you're going to tell me about the person this happened to. It could have been you, maybe it's a customer, maybe it's someone you heard about third party, but you're telling me this story because you have first taken the time to understand who I am and what journey I'm on and empathize with what I want out of life and why I don't have it. So you are going to tell me a story that I can relate to and I can live vicariously through that central figure. Then the trouble happens. They want something, and so they go and do this. But, oh, my God, the, you know, the world falls out from underneath them. They fall into this hole, and then they tried this. But then they really realize that this was the answer. They get out of the hole. Therefore, in the sharing of this story, it underscores my business point I was trying to make to you in the first place. So like the ABT is the structure of and, but, therefore, Act one, act two, act three, set up problem resolution. It is not a story in and of itself, but uses the problem solution dynamic of story structure to hook your audience from the very start. Then you tell a little anecdotal or a short story for super big impact by using these five primal elements. You are now going to take me to a point in time that something actually happened to a real person that had real world impact that is under, going to underscore the point I made my ABT and underscore my business point. Then and only then might I roll out some sales data mm. or features and functions and that kind of thing. But what I'm trying to do is hook my audience by first using that ABT to hook their attention and then to bring their emotion into the story by sharing a true story about a real person 
that has, you know, is trying to achieve something like my audience wants to achieve. Mm. And in that little story, I use those five primal elements of story. Yeah, and I mean, you just pointed out the fact that that story is a learning event. So if we if we look at it through that lens, it's obviously something that has the capacity to create cognitive dissonance or to inspire behaviour change or, say, in the case of business, to influence someone to buy a product. And, you know, with, with that in mind, it enables us to see new ways forward, to see new solutions. So what is it, in your opinion, about storytelling that actually enables mindset and behaviour shifts? And how can storytellers be more intentional about how they use story to ignite that kind of change or to shift the behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, when you hear a story and a really good story, isn't it typically trying to paint a picture of what tomorrow could look like? And especially Mm -hmm. in the branding marketing purpose driven world, we're trying to paint a picture what tomorrow can look like. Now, when you read books like Sapiens, I don't know if you've ever had a chance to read that. I do have the book on my bookshelf. Love that book. And he talks a bit about this. And argument is that Homo sapiens, you and I, as storytelling monkeys, basically became the most invasive, aggressive species in the universe that we know of precisely because you and I and our ancestors could and can plan for tomorrow, can make up a complete and utter fiction as to what tomorrow could look like for our tribe, get everybody to buy into that fiction, and then, God help us if we don't, deliver on it, try to deliver on that fiction. We were able to outcompete like the Neanderthals and others because they believe that they couldn't think like that. Other animals, mammals, whatever, can't imagine and think in fiction for a different tomorrow than we are currently living right now. The only way you can get someone to look in and and think about tomorrow is through a story. There's no chart. There's no stats. There's no data that is going to share with you what tomorrow looks like unless you put it in the context of a story. That's why storytelling is so powerful. But we are so caught up in our left brain logic, reason brain, trying to look and sound smart that we don't take the time to build that soft skill of really knowing how to compel an audience through a powerful story. Mm. So I want to have a a chat about some of the most powerful stories of the last decade. Um, You know, we've seen the rise of some incredible global movements from Me Too to the school strike for climate change and, and Black Lives Matter. Now, there's no denying that digitization has played a big part. However, from a storytelling perspective, in your opinion, how do you take a message and through story turn it into a movement? Like how do these movements achieve the kind of velocity that they have achieved in your opinion? Well, I don't know that story itself can do that for you. It Mm. certainly is the vehicle in how you tell it to get people on board. But, you know, that starts with leadership. It starts with a vision for something greater uh, for the people that it is serving. And then in how you tell that story, of course, certainly adds grease to the wheels to get that moving forward. Uh, Black Lives Matter is a narrative in and of itself. Mm. You know, um, I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, uh, with liberty and justice for all. But liberty and justice is not equally distributed. Mm. Therefore, Black Lives Matter. Now, there's an ABT using our own Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. So it's already embedded in this larger narrative of the systemic challenges that colored people in America face. And that's not just America. They face them in a lot of other countries. But since we're talking about Black Lives Matter, um, and it's been exacerbated by a president that is hell-bent on dividing our country and working off of all of the ills of our country, leveraging those, then hopefully a new president in Biden that will cure that divide and start bringing people together and start really acting like America again. So there's a, there's a narrative that has been around certainly, you know, since the founding of America. Mm. And really over only within the you know past 100 years have women had the right to vote. So 
America is based on these precepts that aren't always played out, and they're not played out in a in in very large fashion. Black Lives Matters now is just, you know, is more timely than ever. I don't know that you need a tremendous story to try to propel that forward because the narrative is already so powerful. Everybody knows it; they mm. see it. So how can you t- you know you know tag tie into that now? Now, global change, climate crisis, that is a whole other thing. I don't think people know how to grasp, you know, grapple with it. Mm. You, you, they, they're, one of my big arguments, in America anyways, is it has always painted climate change and global warming at, as an expense. That, boy, you do this, we're going to lose jobs. You do this, we're going to lose, we're going to lose, we're going to lose. Here's where I think story could really come in, at least for Americans. As you know, when JFK stood on the podium at Rice University and said we were going to put a man on the moon and return them safely to this earth by the time this decade is out, not because it is easy, but because it is difficult, he was able to tell a science fiction story. We're going to put him on a 300-foot rocket made of metal alloys that don't exist, propelled by fuels yet invented, uh, guided by navigation systems that we can't even imagine at this moment, but we're going to do it before this decade is out and return them safely to the planet. Mm. That is the power of complete and utter science fiction in order, you know, and able to, to, to get our masses moving forward, spend $24 billion in 1960s money. That's what the Apollo program cost. But look at, all of the technology that has come out of that, all of the scientific advancements, and how it's impacted not only America, but the world because of that investment. Well, why isn't climate change? Why don't we look at it that way, really around the world, saying, yeah, we're investing in, in not killing ourselves and destroying this planet. We're actually investing in a better life for everybody through the advancements, through the technology, so everything we know we're going to get out of this because we saw that happen when we were trying to put a man on a lifeless body orbiting this planet. Shouldn't we spend that same kind of money on the only body that has life <laughs> so that we can protect it? And then just imagine all of the marvelous advancements that will come of that. Mm. That's an example of where I think story can work, but I think we are just Nobody has any answers, and it's it's just so decisive um, that that we need to rethink how we talk about how we're going to fix our climate cha- mm. challenges. And and I have to ask, from a science communication perspective, how do we do that? Like, what's the line between delivering the data, the facts, and the knowledge versus creating a sense of magic and taking someone on an adventure through a story? Well, I'll ask you that question again, Rebecca. When was the last time you bought anything because of the mm, data? True. <laughs> never. Yeah? never. Never. Yeah. Never. So let's hook them with mystery. What could be? Let's paint a picture of a more fascinating, interesting tomorrow. Total fiction. It's total science fiction at this point. But our intent is true. Our purpose is true. We want to accomplish this. It hasn't been accomplished now, so it's fiction, but let's make it fact. But the only way we're going to do this is we need you to step up and we need some money over here. We need to stop doing this here and start doing this here. But tell stories that can paint that picture of so people go, yes, that's what I want. (laughs) What do I have to do to get there? Mm. Um, but, But climate scientists don't do a very good job of that, do they? Well, you know, we're working on it, aren't we? <laughs> so, yeah. Pat, we were we were chatting uh, on email the other day about juggling kids, and I know that you have three. So, I'm curious. I'm curious to know: is there one thing that you would want to distill in them about the power of purpose driven storytelling? And if so, what would it be? Yeah, well, I juggled them right out of the house, so we're empty nesters now. They're they're grown <laughs> and doing their thing. But I would tell them, you know, as I I have gotten older and maybe just a little bit wiser in all this process, is um, ask yourself, what do, you know, what what do you want? What what's that career? Don't worry about what mom wants and what dad wants and what my boyfriend or girlfriend wants of me. What do you ultimately want? 
And what I do is I ask people, and this is really especially powerful, if you're in, you know, that 14, 15, 16 range, year old range and, and older, is <clears throat> go back and look and find two or three moments in your life that everything changed, that your curiosity took over mm. and sparked something in you that created this passion. That's the turning wow, points. Yeah. That's really fascinating because you're exactly right. Stories. And in fact, I'm working with a large sales organization in um, Chicago right now. I had taken them through a half day story mastery class right before COVID. So it was done in, in person in Florida in February. And I've been working with them on and off ever since. One of the biggest challenges, Rebecca, is I hear is people get caught up with this term of storytelling and they get performance anxiety. And they're like, well, I'm not a good storyteller. I don't have any good stories to tell and whatever. And so we have changed that thinking. And this is what I'd like for your listeners to think about in answer to the question of what would I tell my kids? Say, don't, don't think about your story, but go find a scene. That moment when everything changed in your life that was sort of unexpected came out of nowhere. And it has informed who you are today. Mm. Take us to that moment. Share that scene. Knit enough of those moments and scenes together, and your story is going to find you. Mm. But if you're not an honor, if you, don't, if you don't pay attention to those moments and you don't honor those that really ignited your curiosity and your passion and your purpose in life, then there's a very, very, very good chance you are living someone else's story and not your own. Mm. Yeah, that reminds me a lot. There's a great uh, Brene Brown quote, and she says, you either walk inside your story and own it, or you stand outside your story and hustle for your worthiness. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that's very powerful. It is a really powerful quote. It's one of my favourites. Park, I've, I've come to the last segment in the podcast, and it's a little segment that I call Shots of Purpose. Um, and basically, it's a fireside ch chat where I have five questions designed to explore purpose in the present moment. So you can answer with one word or a few sentences. So if, you, if you're ready to go, <laughs> you <better. laughs> name one emotion that feels like purpose. Optimism. Oh, I love that. That's my favorite. What recently moved you so much that you either shed a tear or welled with some kind of emotion? Talking to my brother, the same one I was telling yeah. you about that went through COVID and talking to him on my podcast just recently about his long haul journey mm -hmm. and his optimism, his courage and his strength that I was so proud of him that he went through hell and yet he still has this great attitude. Yeah, amazing. Human spirit is amazing when, yes. you, when you hear those stories. Yes. Name a book or a podcast that rewired your thinking and tell me why. Jonathan Gonchel's A Storytelling Animal. Okay. And it What's that covers about? <laughs> the, it covers the intersection of brain structure and story structure and why stories, as he says, why, why our brains yield helplessly to the section of story. His, one of his quotes out of his book that I just loved, and it's when I really started studying story uh, back in 2008, 2009, and uh, read this book, and it just fascinated me. It's really a fun read, and it's one that it, it, it sparked a curiosity in me that said, he's onto something. I need to do way more digging on both the neuroscience of this as well as then the story structure side of it, so I can be more powerful in how I use it and how I teach it. Amazing. I asked that question for selfish reasons. It, it enables me to get a really good book list going. So that one I will add on. Now, if you could see through the eyes of any animal, which one would you pick and why? I could see through the eyes of any animal. Boy, that's a good one, Rebecca. You're throwing <laughs> me here. You know, <clears throat> through any animal, you know, and it, it would be a bird or, or an eagle. It would be yeah. a, a bird of prey. I would love to be able to soar above everything, <laughs> humanity, and be able to dart down and just do my thing. I think that would be a really fascinating view of life in mm, general. Yeah, hence the saying, a bird's eye view. Yes. <laughs> 
So this is the last one. Over the course of the podcast today, what has been left unsaid that 100% should be shared? Don't let people shut you up. Yeah. And they are, they are so willing to do that, especially if you make them feel nervous, uncomfortable, self-conscious. And I say make people feel all those things, but in all the right ways, for all the right reasons, coming from the right place. If you are a change maker out there, and I am assuming you are if you're listening to Rebecca's show on purpose, that there are going to be untold numbers of people that are going to try to silence you mm. and try to get you discouraged in your own story, in your own message, because it makes them nervous and it makes them fearful. And when you feel that, again, as long as you're coming from a place of love, you're coming for all the right reasons, you're not doing this as a bully would do it to make them feel bad. You're doing it for their own good. And you're trying to help make systemic change in the world and our climate and whatever then don't let them keep you down. Keep telling your story and encourage them to live into their most powerful stories. Mm, beautiful. Such good advice. So, Park, you're the creator and founder of Business of Story. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you do and, and where we can visit your digital homes? Absolutely. <laughs> you can. My digital home is buried right here at the businessofstory.com. It's my little hobbit, hobble, whatever, yep. for storytelling. I have been in the advertising branding world for 35 years and ran my own ad agency for 20 years, but found my absolute love and interest and curiosity in storytelling in the early 2000 aughts um, and then created Business of Story in 2016. And now I consult, teach, coach, and speak on the power of story to help leaders of purpose-driven brands excel through the stories they tell. And I know that just sounded like a billboard probably because I've said it. it a million times. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and what's the name of your podcast? Is that also Business of Story? If we want to if we want to download some episodes? Business of Story. I've got new story artists. They come out every Monday. I've been doing it for more than five years now and it's all about helping you craft and tell compelling stories that sell. And it's uh, I also do a lot of talking about my new book, Brand Bewitchery, that came out in June. Oh, everything I, missed, I missed that. Tell me about it. Yeah, it's Brand Bewitchery. So it is everything I've learned in my 35 years, again, in the branding world. And then when I really started studying storytelling back in 2004 and how we have applied it to purpose-driven brands ever since. And I talk about my 10-step story cycle system that is based off Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Ooh. So the book is meant to be as much of a guidebook as anything that'll take you through the 10 steps. You can use it for your own purpose-driven brand, be that a your own personal brand to grow your influence or a professional organizational brand to grow your company or offering. And in, so you'll build your, you'll write, craft your brand narrative, Plus, I also have all kinds of story quests or exercises to help you become a more confident and compelling storyteller. And you can get it on Amazon, Apple Books, called Brand Bewitchery. Oh, I love it. I will be checking that out as well. Park, it's been such a joy to speak to you today. Thank you for unleashing so many valuable tools, tips and insights into the art of purpose-driven storytelling. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on the Decoding Purpose podcast. Well, it's been my honour. Thank you so much, <laughs> Rebecca, for having me. You are so welcome. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. If you have enjoyed the podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review. That would be greatly appreciated. And we'd also love you to join the Purpose Movement at Instagram by following us at Decoding Purpose Podcast. Also, a big shout out to our sponsors at Supernova Sound.